Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Missing Link for SLPs podcast. I'm Maddie, your host, speaker, and very passionate speech language pathology advocate. You are listening to the Speechless SLP series with Vanessa Abraham, and you get a unique perspective in each one of these episodes on her journey being the speechless SLP in the ICU bed, unable to talk. So welcome to this series of the Missing Link for SLPs podcast. Glad you are here. Sit back, take a listen. This is our final for now Speechless SLP episode. We have with us Vanessa Abraham, who's been so generous with her time and her heart and her honesty as we've we've just told story after story what it's been like to be the Speechless SLP. Welcome, Vanessa. Thanks for having me back. This is our last episode together. It's been wonderful. I know. It's bittersweet, but Mm -hmm. it's been a good journey for me. Good. Me as well. I love learning new things. And your perspective has just been so, so incredible and so valuable. Today, we're going to talk about you moving forward and where you are now. So we're not going to be talking so much. And and all of this is going to be coming out in a book. So if anybody wants to go back, when your book comes out, they can go back and read all the details about what happened to you in the past. And today, we're going to start talking about where you are now and where you're going to be going forward. Well, I'm back to work. I started back right at the onset of COVID. So it was kind of an interesting transition period there of going back into a virtual world. I will say in some respects, was it was easier because I could work from home. Didn't have to get up and go out as I previously had to, you know, most of us were in our pajamas from our waist down. So um, <laughs> that's just the facts. So in some respects, it was easier, but in some respects, It was a whole new learning curve for me, but life is definitely on the upwards swing right now. Excellent. So you're back working as a school-based SLP, back to being a wife and a mother and a daughter. Would you say you're 100% back? No, it's hard for me to put a percentage on it because in some respects, yeah, I am 100%. Some respects, not quite there. So it's really hard when people ask that question for me. It's like, well... Hard to quantify it. It's a true SLP though question. 90% accuracy, right? Mm-hmm. Over three mm-hmm. consecutive sessions. Yes. Well, and some people would say goals met on all of my things because, you know, you can, <laughs> you can talk, you, can, you know what I mean? You can, you can do all your ADL, so you exit it. Um, but in the patient's mind, you're thinking, oh, but I'm used to this. I'm used to that. Uh-huh. But yeah, you're right. In SLP world, in medical terms, and even school-based, oh, you know what? You can... You know, you can brush your teeth, you can, you can shower yourself, okay, exit, or dismiss. So what areas, so if you're not, you're not 100% in some areas, which is, which is, thank you for the honesty in that, and not painting this rosy, rosy picture of, yep, everything's fine. How are you doing trying to fit into a world as a mom with speech and swallowing and physical disabilities? And where are you with those challenges that you still have to overcome? I think overall, it's still a hard process. Um, I have to give myself a lot of grace and constantly remind myself that it's okay. It's okay that if I just want to stay home today and we're just going to watch movies and we're not going to do, you know, X, Y, Z, we're just going to rest today. Um, It's not an easy one for me to accept, but I have to constantly remind myself that it's okay. You know, there's, there are still a lot of tasks that are hard. Um, The fatigue uh, is definitely one of them. There's so a lot of areas that I struggle with. Um, is the healing phase over? Not at all. I recently started a new therapy, which has been really remarkable for me. So um, it's just continual process, and and it's not over. So what current therapies are you still in? The one that I'm doing is kind of like a electrical stimulation. Oh. Um, and then I'm still doing some infusions here and there. Mm-hmm. So there's still a lot of things that I am doing. Um, so the game, you know, is not over. It's a process. It really is. Just reminding yourself and most patients do, just giving yourself grace and just never, ever give up. And I know you don't give up because I know that you go do medical SLP CEUs to learn more, understand, implement. Tell us about that. Yeah, I've uh, just 
curiosity gets me sometimes. And I think, wow, I had that. I want to learn more about it now because I'm a school-based SLP. I don't deal with vocal cord issues and um, you know, swallowing, PPFMs, all of that stuff. So yeah, I'll see CEU courses offered and I'll think, wow, I want to learn more about that. And I actually have learned some techniques and tried them on myself and have worked. That's how I did a lot of my recovery work from my life struggles that I've had. I'll be introduced to a topic and then I'll go learn more and more and more. So what words of wisdom do you have for the SLP who either herself wants to go and learn more? Where do you find those resources? Oh, uh, speechpathology.com is a big one that I've gone to. You know, you can get, I think, $100 or something for unlimited CEUs during the year. And I'll just go down there and toggle through and think, okay, I want to go learn something about voice. I want to learn something about swallow. And I'll just go in there and I'll look at the titles of the courses. And there was one, um, gosh, probably a year or two ago that I said, oh, this is me. This is what I had. So signed up for it. And, you know, they're an hour. They're easy listening. They're well put together. And, yeah, there's a lot of courses out there. But speechpathology.com has been a great one for me. I like the speechtherapy.com. The Med SLP is a good one. Speechtherapy.com. That one is another good one that I've, now that you say that, yeah, it's been a good one for me too. Mm-hmm. And I'm more intrigued and fascinated by those classes than the, the language and artic ones that I would do for school days just because I can relate <laughs> to them now. Yes. I, I can take these courses and say, oh, I, fit yeah, you I, did, I know how that feels. I live that. I can feel it, taste it, breathe it, everything. I can uh-huh. the experience for it. So it's more interesting for me now. So I have an interesting question. I was going to wait to the end, but I think I'm going to ask it now. I do a lot of coaching with SLPs who are transitioning either in their career somewhere or outside of their career. And there are so many SLPs who are moving into the copywriting area where they're creating materials or the copywriting for websites. So for the SLP who's creating cognitive CogCom materials for a person just like you, what would you, what advice would you give them? Hmm. Uh, you know, visuals, <laughs> you know, anything that they could produce that would be informational for patients, like a little booklet for families that had um, descriptions of you know, medical terms, you know, what is a speech pathologist, first of all, what do we work on? But I think if they could design materials with visuals of what what a trachea is, what cleft and, you know, deflated and all of those terms mean. Like I said before, me even being an SLP, I was completely confused and lost and didn't know what mm-hmm. was going on, why they were cutting into me what all of this was for. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think if they just had like a very simple little booklet that they could get in the hospital somehow that just had description of procedures, machines. I think Anna, our PICS um, counselor that was on the show previously talked about the ICU diary mm-hmm. and their diary that they created at her hospital that had all sorts of diagrams and information um, I think anything like that, that for patients in the hospital setting like myself would be very helpful. So researching natural healing remedies to heal from neurological injuries. That's one of our questions. There was a missing link in your recovery you identified. Can you talk more about that? Um, the missing link, I think overall just one of the things that I've learned is that your body needs a lot of natural remedies. For me, a lot of the medications that I was given for sleep, for depression, for anxiety, for the vocal cords, gosh, what else was I given for? Muscle pain relievers all had some horrendous side effect that would wind me up feeling worse in other areas. So for me, it was like, I really need to research alternative methods to healing because this pain reliever is making me nauseous. Well, I was already nauseous feeling before, so it's just compounding my nausea, and that's not working for me. Or, you know, this antidepressant medication is causing me to not feel anything. Well, I feel like we naturally need to feel 
things. We need to be okay with crying and releasing ourselves and releasing that emotion and crying. It's healing. Mm -hmm. I found antidepressant medications were causing me to not cry or not Mm -hmm. feel anything. And I thought, well, that's counterproductive to healing. I need to be able to cry, to heal, to move past this. So just getting off all the medications that the doctors gave me was was huge for me. I just, all of them, everything. I had so many medications that I just, one by one, thought, this is not helping me. It's making me feel this. And just pursuing a more natural route and giving my body the resources it needed in a natural form. Um, IV infusion with just, you know, vitamins. I do a lot of cranial sacral therapy. That's, that was really helpful for me. No side effects, you know, don't walk out of there feeling worse off by any means. It's, it's one of those therapies or those techniques that you may not feel anything, but the worst that can happen is you feel better. So to me, that's just a win-win. I don't want something that's going to set me back. And that was one that always felt like I was moving forward. You know, food choices, eating healthy, eating a mixture of, you know, proteins. Your body needs a lot of high proteins when healing. So there's just a lot of alternative things that I learned in the process. Did you like make a list? How did you manage all of that? Make a list and then the, I tend to be really like left brain. I would make a list of here are my problems and here are the, <laughs> here are the options, here are the resources. How did you do it? Well, it was trial and error. Honestly, I would try one thing for a period of time and realize, well, that's not working. And I'm actually going through that particular phase right now that I thought, well, I gave that a year. Mm-hmm. and a whole lot of money and did it really do a whole lot for me no which makes me sick but at least I tried it mm-hmm. and that's what I would do I'd give something a try and give it a few months three four five months six months um and realize okay I feel significantly better or I don't feel better and if I don't I drop that idea and move on to the next but it's really hard because sometimes you want to like throw everything at the wall but you got to do one thing at a time and see if that works if that doesn't mm-hmm. work throw whatever you can at the wall and see what sticks and for me cranial sacral therapy helped a lot um the neuromuscular stimulation you know the IVs and, and different natural things are the ones and time I can't mm-hmm. just count that time you know your body just naturally goes through that whole healing process yeah and it takes time I know after my motorcycle accident with when I did not have a concussion it took me what two years to feel like I was back to maybe you know baseline where I was I mean I was so close for so long but it wasn't until that you know two-year mark where I'm like okay I Yep, I'm I'm ready. And I think it's also important to pull out and say that, you know, it might not not have worked for, you know, you tried something, you were really able to crack open that Pandora's box and say, here's what's in here and address them. How what advice do you have people who haven't cracked open that Pandora's box yet because they're afraid what's in there? How do you what advice do you have for them? You know, try maybe my advice would be to try one thing at a time. Don't try it all. Just okay. try, just step out of the box and just try one thing new and give yourself, give yourself that grace of saying, you know, I'm going to try this one thing. Don't do a lot and overwhelm yourself because healing, the healing journey and the critical illness is overwhelming to begin with. Just the mere fact of trying to get out of bed and get in the shower is very overwhelming. So one thing at a time, say just, you know, don't try to roll. I, I relate to this. They told me in, in rehab, roll. Oh. roll. Rome wasn't built in a day, you know, you you can't do 10 things and, you know, it's, it's over. So one thing, try to do that one thing, give yourself a couple months, you know, just say, okay, from June 1st to October 1st, August 1st, I'm going to do this and then I'm going to reassess. And if it's working, continue it. Great. If not reassess, try plan B, but give yourself time because you know, I was always one that's like, I want this done and I want this done now. Uh-huh. And yeah. it's not reality, unfortunately. I wish I had a magic wand, both as a patient and as an SLP. But sometimes you just, you got to just accept somehow, find a way to accept it and move forward. I would also say that for the SLP listening to this, and, and you, you just brought this up, you, we were asked to do big things. You and I had different recoveries, but recoveries nonetheless. And I remember when I was asked to, to, to do something, I was like, you're kidding me. You want me to do what? And so as the SLP, who's asking the patient to do something, really work hard on that trust. 
and then come in at the level that the patient is at with yourself. Work on trusting yourself. If you're in the later stages of healing, listen to that inner voice and follow that inner voice like you're talking about and, and learn to trust yourself and give yourself grace. Absolutely. I agree with that 100%. So PTSDs, do you have any from your experience? Oh, yes. Yes. Many, many. There's triggers all around me. PTSD triggers. That's right. I didn't put the word triggers in there. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's okay. Um, I know exactly what you mean, but they're all around. But one thing I've learned is that with time, you know, the body heals, the mind heals. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I've said in previous podcasts, there's been countless hours of mental health therapy. Mm-hmm. And that helps kind of desensitize some of those triggers. But they, yeah, they are everywhere. They're all around me. What are some of the, the triggers coming out of ICU? I don't know, any, any medical appointment. Oh. You know, follow-ups. Follow-ups are big triggers. I think that's probably with a lot of people. You go into appointments and you're just thinking, okay, what are they going to find? Mm-hmm. Are they going to want to do, do another brain scan? Or they, this time, are they going to find a brain tumor? Are they going to find cancer? Your brain goes off in some crazy tangents sometimes and often thinks the worst, even though we all know that that's usually not what happens, but our brains automatically think negative. Um, So that's definitely one. There's different things at work that are triggers. To be honest, better speech and hearing month is a trigger for me. So this entire month of May, I could just bypass May. I would love to just bypass May and all the better speech and hearing month. Why is that? Um, because I was in a critical state at this time and everybody was oh. talking about it and it just brings up all that memory. So for me to just obliterate better speech and hearing month and maybe put it in November would be awesome. But let's Right around the and, ASHA convention. Yeah, and yeah. That would be more appropriate. Why do we have to have it in May? <laughs> but that's just <laughs> me. Because I associate this time of year right now as my anniversary season. So there's a lot of things that like Wow, I remember that mm-hmm. brings back that memory. That brings, you know, it just there are there is just so many that that trigger thoughts and memories and anxiety that my hands start sweating when I see things and and go places and. So you're aware of your biological response to the triggers. You're aware of your mental response. How do you calm that system down when you have a trigger? What works for you? To- I have to remind myself it's constant mind games of reminding myself of, of the, like, for example, doctor appointments. Do I really think that I'm going to come out of this doctor appointment and they're going to tell me I have a brain tumor or cancer or something, mm-hmm. you know, life-threatening? No, the reality of that, and again, and just having to constantly remind myself, um, deep breathing, I listen to uh, meditations, I have my earbuds and my phone, and I have a bunch of different apps, sound soothing techniques, you know, frequencies, sound frequencies that all, you know, when moments get, or thoughts get too intense, I will tend to, you know, put my earbuds in and try to just take my thoughts somewhere else. Exercise has been a big one for me too, especially that first year, I pretty much felt like I was living at the gym, I wouldn't necessarily be working out, but just pacing the floor, just being out and moving that whole theory of you move a muscle, you change a thought. Mm. That was really important for me back then. Even today too, it's like, okay, I'm starting to have a little anxiety or I'm starting to think certain thoughts. I need to get up and move. Good. And I've heard you say you no longer feel like you're an imposter anymore. Something. I know we don't all have to go through the medical crisis you did, so we don't feel like imposters. But why? Why is that? I don't feel like an imposter because I've lived it. I know, like I said before, and like I've I've experienced every sensory component of it. I've tasted secretions. I've used a PMV. I've been a patient with barium swallows. I've learned to walk. You know, I've I have lived it. I know what it's like to be in that bed where most people haven't been in the bed and I hope they never are in the bed, but I feel like everything else as far as an SLP, I can learn. I can learn. I can read a textbook. I can attend amazing CEU courses, go to convention. Mm -hmm. I can learn about everything, but I know, I know what it feels like in the core of my body. And that's why we've had this whole podcast series is you sharing 
what it's been like being a speechless SLP. So you've got a book coming out. Yeah. You want to tell us about that? Yeah, it's just, it's about my medical journey. It's about an SLP being on the other side, the receiving end of therapy services. Again, what those, what it's like being an SLP and what the things, what things I didn't learn in grad school and what I learned out of the journey. And so this, this series has just been a very small taste of what you've got coming in the book. Yep. Lots more details about your diagnosis, lots more specifics about everything. Yeah, what my family went through, the, the emotional toll, everything, the, the community that rose up and the community that left me too. Yep, we have some of that in common. When is your book going to be ready? You know, I would love to say 2022. I'm hoping this summer to really be able to dive into it um, a lot more with school being over. Um, that's really my summer plan is to just sit down. I bought a new laptop and that's my goal is to just type away this summer. So that's my goal. So you're pivoting possibly from your experiences from school SLP into a branching out into some other areas that are going to be a purpose and, and passion driven for you. You want to share any of those with us or your you thought know, process on that? Yeah, I don't have a clear picture of what that looks like. One thing's for certain, I don't want anybody to ever feel alone in this journey. Um, I don't know if it's, you know, opening a business or, or what it really specifically entails, but I want to help critically ill. I want to help them with the mental side. I want to help them feel hope. I want to help them recover. I don't want to be a medical-based SLP. I know that for sure. Um, I think that's just too emotional for me. I, I think I, I would be too emotional. I wouldn't be able to separate mm -hmm. like my SLPs in the hospital setting. They were so professional with me. And I don't know if I would be able to do it without completely, completely collapsing and being emotional. And um, it'd be a, a huge trigger for me too. So I don't want to be a uh, medical SLP, but I certainly want to help people overcome the, the trauma and the mental anxiety that they go through. So you and I are going to work on a project over this summer with vision boarding. That's something I do with, with the coaching I do. And maybe you'll come back on in an episode down the road where we go over where you've come, maybe come back in a year. And yeah. We'll talk about where you are and what you're doing. Yeah, that is actually my goal is one year from now. I want to have go. it as my timeline. I want the book out and then mm -hmm. one year from now, hopefully by next May, June, embarking on something new. Well, excellent. Excellent, excellent. Vanessa, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for your time, your honesty, your, your vision, and for sharing your story with us. Thank you so much. It's been very therapeutic and healing for me to share my story with others. So go find Vanessa's book, The Speechless SLP, when it comes out. And yeah, you can find other contact information for her in our show notes. Thanks very much. Giving The Speechless SLP her voice back. So, hey, SLPs, that concludes this episode of the Missing Link for SLPs podcast. Please visit my website at freshslp.com. Follow me on Instagram or jump on Facebook to connect in our safe and friendly Fresh SLP community where we are empowering new and transitioning SLPs. If you found value in this episode or in any way had an aha moment or I gave you a fresh perspective, Please show me some SLP love and support me on iTunes or the Apple Podcast app or subscribe to me on YouTube. You got this.